as we move into our message today, we continue with our sermon on Moses, which covers, as you know, a time span of about 120 years, the lifetime of Moses. In Mississippi, I have got to get used to the new clicker. Last week, a tornado hit Mississippi, killing 21 people. I have family in Mississippi, and as I heard about this storm, one of the things that I wanted to look at the news and see is what town had been hit. Was this North Mississippi, which is kind of a tornado alley, or was it South Mississippi, down where my family lives? You know, loss of life is always tragic. Yet it has a much greater impact upon us individually when there's a personal connection. No, this didn't happen where my family lives. It didn't happen where I grew up. But I'm reminded of the personal connection. Hearing the news of this is different when you have loved ones or family or a personal connection, right? Yeah. You hear about an earthquake in a faraway land and that many people died. That's sad news. You have a family member that was on vacation there when it happened and died in it. Different kind of news for us individually. You understand the difference of a personal connection. We skimmed through the ten plagues of Egypt last week. As I was preparing for the message last week, uh, I knew there was a chance it would go a little long, and it did, because uh, doing research and preparation for that, I, I, of course, study the passage, I look at commentaries, I do original word studies, and I oftentimes look and see what other preachers have done with the passage. And most other preachers did not all try to, try to do all ten plagues in one sermon. They generally divided them up. So I knew what I was getting into last week and that we went a little long. We intentionally kind of gave less time to the tenth plague because we're going to dig into it more today. And as we look at this idea, one thing is certain when we think of the tenth plague, and that is death is coming to every home. And in every home, it will be personal. Look with me in Exodus chapter 11. Exodus chapter 11, as we delve into this. And uh, death is always tragic. But when it has a personal connection for us, it is certainly of greater impact for us individually. We look here in Exodus 11 verse 1, and the Lord said to Moses, I will bring one more plague on Pharaoh and on Egypt. Afterward, he will let you go from here. When He lets you go, He will surely drive you out of here altogether. We now look in verse 4. Verses 4-6 through six of Exodus 11 here. And it says, Then Moses said, Thus says the Lord, About midnight I will go out into the midst of Egypt, and all the firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sits on his throne, even to the firstborn of the female servant who is behind the hand mill. And all the firstborn of the animals, all the livestock. Verse 6, Then there shall be a great cry throughout all the land of Egypt, throughout uh, such as was not like it before, nor shall be like it again. Now, chapter 12, verse 12. It says, For I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night, and will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and will and and against all the who? Gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. Remember last week we saw that the ten plagues they targeted the false gods of Egypt. We looked at the false gods of the Nile River that they worshipped, and the turning of the blood to water, and the false god that they worshipped with the head of the frog, and the, then of course the plague of the frogs, and on, so on and so forth. The plagues, uh, they worshipped the quote gods of the land, and then the next few plagues were on the land, and then they worshipped the gods of the air, uh, with the chief one being the sun god, and the next few plagues dealt with the air, from the locust and the hail, and of course the sun being blackened in three days of darkness. Where was Ra, the sun god? For three days, no light, right? And then, 
we came to this tenth plague, which was also a judgment against the gods of Egypt. How would killing the firstborn be a judgment against the gods of Egypt? Well, the Egyptians believed that Pharaoh was the sun god, Ra, incarnate. The firstborn of Pharaoh would be who? The next supposed incarnation of Ra. And so this was a blow against not only Egypt, but it says right here, the gods of the Egyptians. I think I had some water back there. Libby, could you have someone send, bring that up? Maybe send it up with Jackson. Thank you. <coughs> These allergies this week. The wind uh, is particularly bad for those, as you know, because it takes our wonderful allergens and blows them to other states and brings the, the stuff from elsewhere here. Or so I think. Now, we continue on. It says specifically in verse 12, against the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. And we're thinking here of the firstborn being slain. And it mentions Pharaoh's house specifically. It mentions some others. It says it's going to happen throughout all the land of Egypt, even upon the livestock, even upon the animals. But as we think this through, my mind goes to... The house of Pharaoh, of course. I think of, imagine in the palace of Pharaoh. That's not the palace of Pharaoh. It's just pyramids. But imagine in the palace of Pharaoh as that night uh, comes, as midnight approaches. What do you think was going on? I imagine, we, we're not told what was going on, but uh, these were real people uh, living with real warnings and they were defiant and yet they were unsure and they had seen all the other plagues come to pass precisely as God had predicted. And so I imagine something was going on, probably something out of the ordinary. Pharaoh probably had extra guards in the palace that night. No, they're not killing my firstborn. My, my son's not going to die. I've got guards posted throughout the halls of the palace. You know, I've done everything that can be done. Nothing. We, we've got an impregnable fortress here. Everything's going to be okay. And then midnight arrives. And not only does the son of Pharaoh die, but probably some of the extra guards that were likely stationed in the palace were the firstborn in their families. And I imagine death throughout the palace. We look in verse 29 of chapter 12. We're in Exodus 12. Now in verse 29. And we're going to see a transition after this. Okay, It says here in Exodus 12, verse 29, And it came to pass at midnight that the Lord struck all the firstborn in the land of Egypt from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on his throne to the firstborn of the captive who was in the dungeon and all the firstborn of livestock. So Pharaoh rose in the night, he, all his servants, and all the Egyptians. And there was, there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was not a house where there was not what? There was not a house where there was not one dead. Death came, and it was personal. Not far along, away in the land of Goshen. Really, just a stroll away. In the land of Goshen, death came there too. And it was personal there as well. You say, really? Wait, that's where Israel was. Weren't they spared from this plague? They were spared from this plague, but they were not spared from death that was personal. Let me show you. Look with me here in the beginning of Exodus chapter 12. Death came to every home in the land of Egypt that night, and it was personal. And so we look here in Exodus chapter 12. This is a part that I believe is important for us to look at, important for us to consider. It says, Exodus 12 and verse 1, And now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be your beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. In fact, I preached upon this passage at New Year's time, even though it would have been in the spring. The Passover is in the spring. In fact, Jesus died on the Passover. So this is a very uh, Easter-appropriate passage time-wise, but that was the beginning of their year. And so there's lessons that sometimes we take at the beginning or the new year, even for us, from this passage, even though we figure the beginning of the year differently than they did. 
And so it says here in verse 3, Speak unto all the congregation of Israel, saying on the tenth day of this month, every man shall take for himself, what does it say? What kind of lamb? Just a lamb. According to the house of his father, what? A lamb for the household. Now, the word that comes before the word lamb, by the way, lamb is the word that you kids are counting if you're counting how many times we say the word lamb. A lamb, according to the house of his father, a lamb for a household. So what do they have for each house? A lamb. Now, are you wondering if you count it for every person that just said it? <laughs> lamb just got said a lot. I, I don't think you should try it. That, that, would, that probably wouldn't work. Notice it says in verse 4, And if the household is too small for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next to his house take it according to the number of persons. In other words, oh, further down we discover the lamb is going to be eaten. Two people aren't going to eat a lamb. If you've got an average family back then of, say, you know, eight or ten kids, you'll probably do all right with a lamb, but if you don't have that many, then you might combine a little bit, right? And so, verse 4, And if the household is too small for the, what? Lamb. Let him and his neighbor next to his house take it according to the number of the persons. According to each man's need, you shall make your count for what? The lamb. Now, we're going to skip verse 5 for now. We're going to go to verse 6, the first part. Now, you shall keep it. What is it referring to? The lamb. Until the 14th day of the same month. So, they go out to the field and they get what? A lamb. And they keep the lamb from the tenth day of the month. That's, that's what it says right there in uh, verse 3. On the tenth of this month. Until the what day? Fourteenth day of the month. Now, I'm from Mississippi. You'll have to help me on the math. How many days is that? See, I always love tricking people with math questions while I claim to be from Mississippi. That's five days. You said four, I know. Count it up. 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. That's five days the lamb's in your house. Inclusive reckoning, of course. Five days. The lamb is where? Now why did I say in your house? Did I make an assumption? No, if you study the conditions at which the Israelite slaves lived in, what did they have as property? A little shack house, that was it. Where were they going to keep it? Was it uncommon in ancient times to have livestock in the home? No, it would be kept in the home. You know, like you do with puppies and cats. You know? I mean, down south, there's folks, you know, back when I was a kid, lived way out in the country, their chickens might make it in the house from time to time. But a lamb being in a house in that culture, in that day, they had to keep it up from the 10th day of the month to the 14th day of the month, and most of them literally only had a little shack they lived in. Where are they keeping it? It's there with them. They're keeping it up. Something's about to get personal, especially if you have little children. This lamb is going to be sacrificed. This lamb is going to die. This lamb is going to die a substitutionary death. What does that term mean? It is going to be a substitute for the firstborn in your household. It's going to die in the place of the firstborn in your home. There will be death in every home in Egypt, and it will be personal. The Egyptians lost their firstborn. The Israelites saw the death of the lamb. But it was there in the home. Now, think about this for a moment. And let's process it through. What's taking place? Especially if you have little kids. As an adult, you know, don't get attached. 
Little lamb, it's in the house, 10th, 11th, 12th, 13th, 14th. It's going to be in the home with you five days. Don't get attached. But you've got a four-year-old and a two-year-old in your home. Oh, you know what happened. There are about two million Israelites. Let's just, statistically speaking, were their homes with two-year-olds and four-year-olds in them? You know there were. Can you explain to them, don't get attached to the lamb? No, it, it doesn't work that way, does it? Think this through. What's taking place? Guys, you can fall in love with a little baby lamb really fast. I remember when I was a kid, a local farmer called my dad, and they had had... Uh, a, a you, a, a mama sheep, and she had had two babies. How many babies? And she rejected one. It happens on the farm sometime. She rejected one. And so call my dad, would y'all like to come get this lamb and bottle raise it? Well, we did. We bottle raised a little lamb. You fall in love with them right away. My younger sister named it appropriately Baba. Because that's all it did was go bam, bam, all the time. And so it was named Bam Bam, and we just fell in love. You can fall in love with a little lamb very easy. And so there was a lamb. It was called a lamb. It was called the lamb. And it was brought into the home. They had to keep it up. They had to keep it with them. They had to keep it out of the field from the 10th day to the 14th day of the month. Five days they had this little lamb with them. And they had little children, many of them in the homes. What was happening? Well, little kids tend to play with whatever is around. Think about this just a moment, okay? Okay. Day one, they're excited there's a new animal in the house. Have you ever brought a new animal home? Have you ever brought home a puppy or a kitten? Had little kids, do they get excited? They're excited. There's new life. There's a new animal in the home. You as a parent are going, don't get attached. Don't get attached. Don't get attached. Can you even explain this to the two-year-old and the four-year-old? You see what's coming. You see attachment, you see friendship, you see connection, and you see death. And you can't do anything about it. It's happening. And so, they're excited on day one, the new animals in the home. On day two, they play with him and they name it Fluffy. Probably not, but uh, that's, that's the name I'm going to go with. Fluffy. And they're just loving having this new animal in the home. They've been excited. They've named it. On day three, as they're playing with each other and with this new animal in the home, say, Mommy, Daddy, can we keep Fluffy forever? And it just stabs you right there. Because no, you can't keep Fluffy forever. But you can't even explain it at this age. On day four, the poor little thing's getting drug around your little one-room shack of a house by a string as they're playing with it and trying to teach it to lead. Right? Are you there? Are you imagining? Your, your parents, I mean, you're, you have to put yourself at the right age to have kids that are two and four in the home, right? Are you thinking? And so you're seeing this happen. What's taking place? Well, here's what's happened. See, it was called in verse 4, the lamb, the lamb. In verse 3, it was called a lamb, a lamb. But it's in your home, verse 3, on the 10th day of the month to verse 6, the 14th day of the month. So what is it called in verse 5? It's no longer called a lamb. It's no longer called the lamb. It's called your lamb. Huh. You think Scripture is intentional in changing from a lamb and from the lamb to your lamb? I think so. I think something's taking place here. 
Well, we continue on and we read here, verse 6, Now you shall keep it up until the fourteenth day of the same month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it at twilight, at dusk, as it's getting dark. Verse 7, And they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the house. That would be the two doorposts, you know, the either side of the door, the, the post, the wall on either side of the door, the lintel, that's the, the board that goes across the top of the door. So, as a parent, it's that fifth day, the fourteenth day, and let's say you're the dad in the home and you know what has to happen. The kids are playing with the lamb through the day and it's just tearing your heart out. You know what has to happen. And finally, as it almost gets dark, you, you just go pick the lamb up. You don't even know what to say to the kids maybe. I don't know exactly how it happened. I'm sure it played out differently in, in thousands of homes. And you walk around the back of your little shack and you set the lamb down on the ground between your legs and you pinch it there and you take the belt. You take the knife out of your belt and you reach there as you hold the little lamb and you do what has to be done. And you catch the blood in a bowl. And you take the hyssop and you put it on either side of the doorpost and above the doorpost. Now, I don't know about you, but if I'm there and I've imagined this, I, I'm the... the, the, the the destroying angel is coming through the land of Egypt. And when he sees the blood, he's going to pass over us. Now I know by faith a little bit of blood here and a little bit of blood here and a little bit of blood here is all that's needed. But I'm putting a lot of blood here. And I'm putting a lot of... I'm painting it red with blood. You see this? We believe we are doing what we were asked to do. And then the lamb is baked whole. And he is eaten. It says, verse 8, And they shall eat the flesh that night, and roast in fire with unleavened bread, and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. Interesting. Verse 13, Now the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. Notice they needed the blood on the outside, but they ate the lamb because the lamb is not the lamb, it's your lamb. And it's not just a lamb, it is a symbol of, well, John 1.29, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. It is a symbol of Jesus. And you don't just need Him on the outside, they ate the Lamb. The symbol is, we need Jesus on the inside. So verse 13, now the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you and the plague shall not be to you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. They were told how this would happen and that one day, if you read the whole story, their, their children would ask them, even their grandchildren would ask them, why do we do this? And they would explain it. Can you imagine? Now that four-year-old has grown up. Israel wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. And at age 44, that four-year-old of yours went into the promised land. And after being settled in the promised land many, many years, that four-year-old of yours, now all grown up, living in the promised land, has grandkids that say, Grandpa, why do we do this? And he says, let me tell you about my friend. You see, we brought this little lamb into the house. It wasn't just some lamb in the field. It lived with us. It wasn't just a lamb. It was our lamb. And it had to die so that I could live. Now that is a symbol pointing forward to the true Lamb, the Messiah, that will die for the sins of the whole world that we might live and not face the second death. Yeah, there was death that night in every home in Egypt. And it was personal in every home. Those who followed God's prescription for protection and for salvation certainly received it. And so, 
as we look here to the Scriptures. Think about this. Jesus is the Lamb. But is He your Lamb? You see, there's a difference between saying Jesus is a Lamb, Jesus is the Lamb, and Jesus is your Lamb. Jesus can and has died for the sins of the whole world. But He may not be your lamb. You have to accept that sacrifice. You have to believe in Him. You have to have a relationship with Him so that He's not a lamb. He's not the lamb. He's your lamb. Jesus is the lamb. But is He your lamb? Oh my. I remember a story. Now, this wasn't a lamb. It was a pig. But we used to raise a pig every year on the farm in Mississippi. You know, back before we studied certain things. And then we tended to harvest the corn with a rifle as well as with a bucket. Meaning we would kill about seven deer a year out of the corn patch. And then we would take them into the slaughterhouse with the pig and have deer and hog sausage made. And I had been assigned <coughs> to feed the pig. <coughs> In fact, it had been my chore as the oldest for several years. And then one year, my dad decided that that chore now went to my younger brother. Now when I fed the pig, you feed the pig whatever there is, slop, I didn't even slow down. As I went by the pig's pen, I just threw whatever there was over the top. He'll eat it. I didn't slow down. My brother's wired different, very tender hearted. He would go there and open the gate and go in and he would pet the pig. And he would scratch it between its ears and he would feed it. Now I would name the pigs things like pork chop, bacon, such names as these. He would give them other like pet names. My dad realized that this wasn't working for my younger brother to be the one who fed the pig. But he was still the pig. And so one day while he was over, my brother that is, playing at a friend's house, the pig went bye-bye. He came home and the pig was gone. But it wasn't gone but for a few weeks. After a few weeks, the pig came back to us. In this little you know, wax paper wrap mixed with deer meat. And we sat down for supper with biscuits and deer and hog sausage. My younger brother's favorite at the time, back in the day, you know. Do I have to put all these disclaimers in there? Yes, I do. So, we are all just eating, eating, eating. And my younger brother is not eating the sausage. And finally my dad asked him, why aren't you eating the sausage? And he sat there and didn't want to answer. And my dad asked him again. My dad, back in the day, if he asked you a question, you, you're going to answer it. And so he asked him again, why aren't you eating the sausage? It's your favorite. And he burst out with these words, I just can't eat my friend. As I read this passage, those words just resonated with me because what are they going to do after not a lamb and not the lamb, but your lamb has died, they're going to roast it and they're all going to eat it. I don't know, did any Israelite kids out of, say, a whole bunch, two million people total say, I can't eat my friend? I don't know. But there was a personal connection that wasn't there. You know, just going through the drive through at McDonald's and ordering something. Personal connection. I challenge you today with a thought. Jesus is the Lamb, but is He your Lamb? And I'm going to explain the term gospel-hardened to you today. Gospel-hardened is the term I'm going to explain. We in our culture today especially those of us raised in church, raised in Christianity, have a tendency to be gospel-hardened. Let me explain it. When the gospel is first preached in the mission field, 
And people have never heard the story of Jesus. And they hear how He died on the cross in our place. He, he laid down His life, even though He could have called 10,000 angels to destroy the world and set Him free. He died alone for you and me. They hear the story of Jesus dying for the sins of the world, but not just for the sins of the whole world, but for you personally they tend to be moved to tears when they first hear the story. But when you've always heard the story, and you've always known the story, and you haven't heard it once or twice, but you've heard it a hundred times, nay, five hundred times, nay, a thousand times, nay, you've lived with it every day, you've always known that story, sometimes you've, sometimes you've never had the impact in your life of what Jesus has done for you, even to the same degree as a heathen hearing it for the very first time. That's called gospel-hardened. Those that are gospel-hardened are often the hardest to reach. Think about that. Are you gospel-hardened? I think we all have a tendency to be a little bit. When you think of Jesus, do you think of Him as the one that died for the whole world, which is true? Or do you also think of Him as the one who died for you? Do you think of Him as a lamb? Or as your lamb? You see the difference? When you sing songs that if you really thought the words through and allowed them to impact you, would cause you to break into tears in the middle of the song service and not be able to finish the song if you really processed what you were singing. And yet it doesn't impact you that way. What do you do when you find yourself gospel-hardened? I think the solution is right here. There was a lamb in the field, and they went out and got it, and it was the lamb, and they kept it up from the 10th day to the 14th day of the month, which for little kids was plenty. What's the lesson? If the life of Jesus and the death of Jesus and the gift of eternal life through Jesus does not impact you the way it should... And you simply know that right now as the Holy Spirit speaks to you in your heart, whether it impacts you the way it should or doesn't then what do you do? You bring Jesus into your home. You spend time with Jesus. You read the Gospels again. You make sure that you are spending time with the Lord every day. And what I can tell you is, you won't walk that many days with Jesus. It might be a week, it might be three weeks, it might be three months. But you won't walk every day with Jesus without Him going from being the Lamb to being your Lamb. Heavenly Father, we thank You That Jesus came as the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. But that it's more personal than that. And that He died for me. Lord, I ask that You will help that to have the impact upon my heart that it should and upon the hearts of each person here. That we would truly accept Jesus as our Savior and not just as the Lamb for which we're so thankful, but as our Lamb, which makes so much more difference in our lives. And this we pray in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen.